Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi requested former Vice President Pence use the 25th Amendment to essentially take the power of the presidency from President Trump. Vice President Pence declined to use that particular amendment, but the very fact that it was brought up, well, that's a historical moment in and of itself. But what is the 25th Amendment exactly? How does it work and was it ever meant for a situation like that? I talked with one of the architects of the 25th Amendment to answer those questions and better understand the amendment that could still change the course of America. And then, Joseph Moreno takes us into the potential legal consequences that those Capitol building stormers might be facing now that the FBI is beginning to make arrests. The consequences are real, especially for those active duty and reserve service members caught in the fray. I'm Rod Rodriguez, and this is the back room. When it comes to understanding the 25th Amendment, there's probably no better person to talk to than John Furick. My name is uh, John Furick. I'm a, I'm a lawyer and a professor of law at Fordham uh, University Law School. I wrote a book in 1976. It was called the uh, 25th Amendment, which, uh, and Senator Bayh wrote the foreword to the book. And it's a book that's uh, drawn on by a lot of historians and political scientists and others for uh, education and understanding of the 25th Amendment. John Furick literally wrote the book on the 25th Amendment and literally helped write the amendment itself, which was ratified back in 1965. Dan Furick described the 25th Amendment in basically four parts. One part is uh, what happens when a president dies, resigns, or is removed from office on a, a, con a conviction after an impeachment, is the vice president becomes president for the rest of the term of that president. So the first part really clarifies what happens if the president doesn't finish his term. It outlines that the vice president completes the president's term, no special elections for a new president, and the VP doesn't get to restart the four-year clock on his presidency. If the president leaves office after three years of his four-year term, the VP takes over for that remaining one year, at least until the next election. The next part of the amendment has to do with what happens when a vice president dies in office and you have no vice president. Probably didn't realize, but prior to 65, there wasn't a plan to replace the vice president if he became the president. When the presidents died in office, the vice president became the president for the rest of the term, leaving a vacancy in the vice presidency. And if he had those years to the years when vice presidents died in office, there's a substantial amount of time we operated without a vice president. So 25th Amendment closes that gap in the Constitution by setting up a process to uh, replace the vice president who had died or had resigned or was removed. The same thing would be a vacancy. The 25th Amendment allows the former vice president, now the actual president, to nominate a new vice president. The idea here is that since the president and vice president work so closely together, it only makes sense for the president to choose who he, who he or she would want to work with. But that VP still needs to be approved. However, both houses of Congress uh, have a duty to decide whether to confirm that choice, not just the Senate, which is normally the, 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 the forum for presidential appointments, but to replace a, a vice president, they need both houses to approve by a majority vote. So the first part of the 25th Amendment establishes the time frame for the new president's term. The second part establishes how to replace the former vice president. Now let's talk about the third part. The third part has to do with inability of a president. And there are two provisions. The first provision says, if the president is going to undergo a, uh, an operation, using that as an example, and he's going to be unconscious, he can anticipate a need to have a, a, an acting president when he's unconscious. So he has the uh, opportunity to transfer how his duties to the vice president and the vice president, Constitution said, becomes the acting president. That clarifies what happens in the case of inability. The vice president becomes the acting president. As soon as the president recovers from that operation, you might say, and the effects of the operation, he can say, I'm ready to go back and, and resume my powers and duties. Former Vice President Dick Cheney was the acting president of the United States twice, while then President George W. Bush underwent colonoscopies under sedation. Once the president was awake and aware, he resumed his duties. That's the first provision. Now, the second provision, that's the one that made some headlines. What happens if the president is disabled, uh, there's an inability, and he's not declaring it? Where do you go? 
And Section 4 of the 25th Amendment says it's a process in the sense that doesn't define an ability. It leaves the judgment call to the vice president and a majority of uh, the heads of the executive departments. Uh, shorthand for that would be cabinet. So the, uh, the vice president, a majority of the cabinet, have the power to declare a president disabled. The disabilities that were being considered when this was written were things like the president's plane goes down and rescue teams are trying to reach him or a kidnapping. And therefore, uh, physically unable to uh, discharge the powers and duties of the office. And it's important to have uh, somebody in place doing, uh, doing that while you deal with those situations. This section of the 25th Amendment was written for a situation in which the president was alive, but incapable of executing his responsibilities. But there have also been other considerations, such as mental stability. You find in the legislative history of Section 4, uh, cases of physical and mental um, illnesses. Those are commonly referred to as physical or, or mental illnesses that prevent uh, a president from discharging the powers and duties of the office. And there's a need now to have a vice president doing the public business. And Section 4 enables us to point to a, a provision of the Constitution that covers that situation. It's like a safety net kind of thing. If the cabinet uh, uh, does not accept the president's disagreement, that is to say, if the, if the cabinet says, uh, we believe you're, you're disabled, then Congress receives that issue and has to resolve the issue. Congress is out of session, it has to assemble within 48 hours to handle that disagreement. And then uh, it has 21 days to collect information, maybe seek out medical assistance, whatever it is, to figure out uh, who's right and who's wrong in terms of this uh, disagreement. It takes two thirds of both houses to prevent the president from resuming his powers and duties. Another way to put it is, if the president secures a vote in either house of one third plus one of the members uh, of that house, he immediately resumes uh, his powers and duties. You don't wait for the second house to act because uh, one house has already acted and said, uh, the majority might have said uh, you're disabled, but the president secured uh, one third plus one. All right, so if the president is alive and the vice president and the majority of the cabinet feel the president is disabled for any reason, then the vice president can assume the position of acting president. But let me make clear that the president is always the president in this process. Uh, he has the title and it's his office. All the vice president is doing is assuming the powers and duties uh, of the presidency to discharge the powers and duties as acting president. So the word acting president and president is very important. And at no point can you remove from office. There's a lot of statements that uh, about removing from office. You can't remove from office uh, under the 25th Amendment. You just can suspend uh, the discharge of the powers and duties by a president during that time period because the, the, the powers and duties are with the vice president as acting president. And he's still the vice president. So why have an impeachment process if the vice president has the ability in place already to assume the powers of the president? It's important to uh, focus on the fact that uh, uh, the impeachment process is involved with the punishment and the acts that constitute uh, a high crime and misdemeanor. It has both houses involved in that. The 25th Amendment is not involved. It's not a punitive amendment. It's there to assist the nation and assist with the discharge of the powers and duties of the president. And it's for the vice president and the cabinet to take account of all the conditions and circumstances and, and make a judgment. President Trump's term has come to an end. So why are we still talking about this? Why does the 25th Amendment still matter? Well, before President Trump, most Americans had no idea that there was a 25th Amendment, much less about the ability for the vice president to remove the president's authority. Not his office, but his executive powers. However you might feel about this president or the last one, the last term has certainly brought a spotlight on the office and the powers that can and cannot be used. But let's take a let's take a moment here to look into the future of the Biden administration, the Biden era. Joe Biden assumed the office of the presidency at the age of 78 years old. 
Kamal Harris is only 56 years old. I get it, it's 2021, 78 is the new 50, but let's be real for a second. 78 is still pretty old. And as someone who's currently caring for their elderly parents, I can attest to the fact that as you get older, each year gets progressively tougher. And we are not talking about a retiree hanging out golfing, you know, and just taking it easy in the last years. We're talking about being the most controversial, most hated, most feared, most spoken about human being on the earth. The President of the United States is the leader of the free world and inherits upon his swearing in over 200 years of governmental dumpster fires. Have you ever seen the pre-president and post-president pictures of Bush Jr. and Obama? Biden's coming in already silver-haired and worn down from decades in public office that include eight years of being the vice president. It's very possible, and perhaps even likely, that Kamal Harris might become the acting president if President Joe Biden undergoes a surgery or treatment due to an age-related illness. What happens if his judgment becomes clouded or he's disabled again due to age-related events or medical issues? The 25th Amendment is an important piece of our Constitution, one we need to understand how it works. And I want to thank Dean John Furick, who, by the way, is a U.S. Army veteran for his time doing this interview and for his service to this nation. I mean, he helped write an amendment to the Constitution for crying out loud, so that's a, that's a pretty damn impressive thing to do. When we come back from the break, attorney Joseph Moreno talks about some of the legal consequences those Capitol rioters could be facing when we return. The veterans involved in the Capitol Hill riots were fueled by political news stories that they read online. Army combat vet and veteran advocate Christopher Goldsmith says that our enemies have been fueling the fire by corrupting our social media sites for years. So I first discovered the fake Vietnam Veterans of America organization, which was run by uh, Bulgarians and Russians uh, and had a quarter of a million followers who were spreading viral, hateful content back in summer of 2018. The scene on the Senate floor as rioters broke through the doors and began vandalizing and looting our nation's capital was disgusting and sad to say the least. But what made an already awful moment in American history even more sour was the fact that there were a number of veterans and service members that were part of that group of people breaking a number of federal laws. I wanted to know more about the consequences of those actions. And to help me figure this out, I found another lawyer to help explain this whole thing to me. Uh, my name is Joe Moreno. On the military side, I'm a lieutenant colonel in the U.S. Army Reserve JAG Corps. On the civilian side, I'm a lawyer here in the Northern Virginia area. I've served as a federal prosecutor in the Justice Department in the National Security Division. I've been in private practice, and now I am general counsel of a defense technology company in Northern Virginia. I, I'm not speaking, of course, for the U.S. Army. Uh, I am not on active duty at the moment. Uh, and I certainly am not giving legal advice. So for any of you listeners who hear what I say, uh, if you have a, a legal question about something you have done or are thinking about doing, please consult an attorney, uh, military or civilian, depending on your circumstances. I wanted to first get his impression about what he thought and felt about what happened at the Capitol building before we jumped into the legal issues around it. Well, Rod, it's the, um, it's the unfortunate... Uh, explosion of people that have been misinformed, that have been led to believe certain things that are demonstrably not true, boiling over in, in something that it completely distorts what, what we celebrate in this country, which is freedom of peaceful protest, of First, of First Amendment rights, of free expression. We do not, of course, protect criminal trespass, destruction of property, uh, trying to prevent the lawful meeting of Congress to perform its constitutional duties. And so I, like I'm sure tens of millions of our fellow Americans, I was horrified. I mean, this is um, something so beyond what is tolerable in our society. And while perhaps it's not surprising based on the rhetoric we have heard over the past few months, it is still nonetheless shocking and cannot be tolerated particularly as we learn that some of those individuals who were part of that destruction were members of our armed forces. 
Early reports from law enforcement officials to include the FBI have identified veterans, reservists, and National Guard members. It's possible that an active duty service member will be implicated or identified as being at the riot. I think one already did, but as of this recording, I'm not completely sure. So what do these statuses mean in terms of the possible consequences? Your status has a big impact. If you are an active duty service member in any of the branches, the, the Uniform Code of Military Justice applies to you 24-7 anywhere you are. So many service members, I'm sure all service members know that there are many things you cannot do when you're in uniform. That does not mean that you can take off the uniform and go ahead and do things and not expect consequences. So if you commit and I won't even get into you know, the, 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 the complicated legal theories of whether this was an insurrection or sedition, let's just call it criminal trespass, right? Destruction of property. Uh, if you are a member, uh, an active duty member of the military and you conduct those kinds of crimes, whether it's on state property or on federal property, you can be subject to state or federal law and prosecuted by either a state prosecutor or a US attorney, or you can be prosecuted in the military. In certain cases, you can be prosecuted by both. And that actually gets into some, uh, some issues about jurisdiction, but there have been cases where you can be tried a couple of times for effectively the same conduct by different authorities. And that's not double jeopardy, what, despite what people think. Now, the rules are a little different for reservists, right? The, generally speaking, the Uniform Code of Military Justice only applies to reservists if they are in active status, or in drill status under certain circumstances. So if you are a reserve member and you are not on annual training orders or other types of orders, and you're not in a drill status that day, then you are a, a civilian and you are subject to civilian laws. Uh, generally, there are some exceptions, but that's the general rule. If you are a retiree, an active duty retiree, there are certain circumstances where you can be recalled to active duty and prosecuted under the UCMJ. It's not done often. And there are some courts that have held that there's questionable constitutionality around that. So military prosecutors don't exercise that option very often. And it's usually reserved for things that happen overseas. Let's say by former military who are now civilians serving on an installation um, and they're investigated and prosecuted by the military, not so much for something that happens in the US. And then you have reserve retirees, but that recall rule does not apply to them. So in, in each case, you have to think about who is this person? What was their duty status at the time, whatever it was happened, whether it was you know those events that happened here in DC last week or something else, and then what, uh, what laws could possibly be used to prosecute those individuals. Let's use the example of the recent arrest of an army reservist who was identified as being part of the mob that broke into the Senate floor. What could happen to him? The operative word here, what could. So, I mean, I, I don't know, Rod, obviously the, the details of this case, but let's just say, you know, in, in, as an example, in, in your case, the, you know, a reservist not on active or even reserve duty does something wrong uh, in, in this case, because it was on federal property and the individual sounds like is being investigated by the FBI, he will most likely be prosecuted by the U.S. attorney, in the District of Columbia, and he will face federal charges. Now, it does not mean that the military has no say in the matter. Um, it would be a stretch to probably try to apply the UCMJ. However, of course, the Army and the other branches have extensive non-criminal remedies at their disposal. So while they might not court-martial the individual for what he did, they can chapter him out. They can separate him. They can reprimand him, right? Those are all tools at their disposal. Now, certainly the individual can make the argument, well, I wasn't on reserve status, but there are lots of things that reservists are punished for that happen when they are not technically on reserve status, but can have consequences. They might not be criminal UCMJ consequences, right? That's a big deal. But you can be reprimanded. You can be barred from enlistment. You can be separated administratively. Not the same as a court-martial, but certainly still serious. So just because this individual is looking at federal civilian charges does not mean he's off the hook when it comes to the military. 
So it's entirely possible to get the boot from the military through the form of a chapter due to bad conduct. But what about a dishonorable discharge? Could you get a dishonorable discharge without a court martial? Uh, so the short answer is no. However, there is a another option there. So there's three not so great ways to have your discharge from the military characterized, right? There is a dishonorable discharge. There's something called a bad conduct discharge or a BCD. Both of those require a court martial conviction, right? They are federal convictions. They go on as a federal record, um, very difficult to expunge. But there is a third not so great option and that's called an other than honorable discharge, right? Or an OTH uh, characterization of separation that is administrative. And so in an example that you pose, let's say you know, a, a reservist is, is convicted and sent to federal penitentiary for several years, cannot fulfill his or her reserve duty, aside from the fact that he's now a convict. Um, that's a pretty simple chapter separation and the army can push for an OTH discharge. So it's not as severe as a dishonorable or a bad conduct, it's not criminal in nature, but it certainly has an impact on future prospects, uh, inability to re-enlist, access to veterans benefits and things like that. So that's most likely what would happen in the scenario you pose. What about active duty service members? So far, an army captain, I understand, is the first active duty member identified as being under investigation for participation in the riot. What happens to her could happen to other active duty service members. So for active duty service members who potentially commit a crime, the military will most likely look first to its criminal remedies. And so it will look to the UCMJ and whether or not it wants to bring charges. If the FBI and the US Attorney's Office is also looking to bring charges for the same conduct, there will likely be a discussion between military and civilian authorities and they will work out who gets the first bite at that apple. So there will be some behind the scenes conversations going on there about who should prosecute that individual, but someone will. So criminal would most likely be the first line of attack. Then there are, like we said, those administrative options the army also has, which it can also bring in addition to a criminal case. So the army has quite a lot of tools at its disposal when it comes to disciplining active duty service members. What about retirees? I wasn't able to get a hold of a VA lawyer to discuss if the VA has any role to play in all this, but when it comes to active duty retirees, the DOD does have the ability to take action. If you were an active service member who did 20 or, or more years and has a retirement, there are options for the military to recall you for activities that you engage in even after you retire. So you're a civilian, you're, you're collecting your pension, you do something criminal, the military can, in certain circumstances, recall you and try you under the UCMJ. Now I said earlier, they don't exercise that option too often, and it's usually in cases where it's difficult to bring other types of charges. So like I said, the former military who's now a you know, DOD civilian, working on an installation overseas, commits a crime, that's sort of a prime candidate. It's unlikely they would exercise that option for someone here in the US because there's plenty of ways to prosecute people here in the US. They don't really need to call them back on active duty to then prosecute them. Um, but, but it's an option. So yes, the military does have that option that they can exercise. There is still a lot of speculation about what exactly the charges will be against those arrested for their roles in the Capitol building seizure. So far, we've heard about federal charges of trespassing, vandalism, and destruction of property, but there could be other considerations. Well, so anytime anyone were to go on to federal property, whether it's Capitol Hill or one of the many federal buildings here in the National Capital Region, if you, if you are not supposed to be there, if you take something with you, if you destroy something while you're there, uh, if you injure someone while you're there, you are subject to all kinds of federal laws, right? About criminal trespass, destruction of property, uh, misuse of federal property, that sort of thing. What was unique about what happened on January 6th at the Capitol was that it can be argued credibly that the purpose of the individuals that were there 
were to specifically impede a constitutional function of both houses of Congress, which at that point was convening to certify the results of last year's election. So that's a big difference. So it certainly doesn't make it any better to do it on a weekend or another day when Congress may or may not be in session. But the particular function that was, in fact, delayed, right, several hours, um, that is at the heart of what was happening and, and why you may see uh, some, some the kinds of charges from federal prosecutors against these people that we don't typically see in this country. Right. But they're on the books and they are used in the most uh, extreme circumstances. And this might be one of them. What kind of sentencing could individuals found guilty of federal charges for trespassing and destruction of property be looking at? Right. So so sentencing depends on a lot of different factors. And while many different laws have they have mandatory uh, maximums. It always comes down to the federal judge, right? We used to have things called sentencing guidelines that were required for judges to adhere to. Now they are, they are seen as simply guidelines. So every federal judge in every case makes his or her own decision about sentencing. So it's hard to say in every different case. However, that being said, we're talking about many years uh, uh, for convictions on these types of crimes. There were multiple deaths that either occurred at or resulted from the riot. Could the folks being arrested be held legally responsible for those deaths? Well, I mean, so we hear at the, at the various state levels, you know, distinguishes between first degree murder and second degree murder. And that, that, that uh, differs depending on what state law you're talking about. And then federal law has its own way of distinguishing. And the UCMJ has its own way of distinguishing types of murders. Uh, obviously, it's more serious if you are the direct cause of someone's death and there is no legal justification for doing it. If, you, if it's more of an indirect cause, so for example, you set in motion certain events that but for those events, that person would not have died, then you can also have liability that's usually considered either second degree or sometimes they call that manslaughter. So um, it, it's hard to say the likelihood that they will charge individuals with contributing to the deaths of either the citizens or, or police officers um, that day, but it's a possibility. And so certainly when you engage in either speech that incites a mob or partake as part of that mob, these are the kinds of things that could happen. And you know, if, 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 if death and destruction and injury uh, come as a result, you certainly could be held liable. The fact of the matter is no one won. Good people, people with families, careers, lives will suffer greatly because of some serious poor judgment that was supported and encouraged by folks that probably won't see one day in court or lose one night of sleep. People died. Real people with families that will mourn them till they pass on themselves. It was a day of needless violence, needless sacrifice, and if nothing else, it showed our worst side. The irony of a police officer beaten by men and women holding Blue Lives Matter's flags isn't lost on me, and it shouldn't be lost on you. Men and women who claim to be the last line of defense for the Constitution watched as their fellow rioters destroyed and looted the Capitol building. Whatever point that was supposed to be made was lost. A divide deepened, and our nation is now even more vulnerable to the influence of enemies. I once dreaded the drumbeat of war, but today I hear something else in the air. The whirring and grinding of an industry of fear hatred and anger, a call for labels like domestic terrorism, a label that will undoubtedly become politicized and the result will be a breakdown of our freedoms as we all frantically point fingers at each other trying to scream over the other guy louder and louder, terrorist, terrorist. The real terror was felt by a police officer beaten with a fire extinguisher or the U.S. Army veteran and Capitol Police officer who used himself as a human bait to lure the rioters away from the potential victims of their violence. Tonight, young men and women service members are doing their checks on riot gear and rifles, fearing that they might be pushed to shoot their fellow Americans. So where does all this end, folks? We are either going to finish this chapter of American history and start a new one about how we healed the divide and rebuilt ourselves. Or we'll write the final chapter in American history with a heavy heart of regret and lament what could have been. Folks, I'm Rod Rodriguez. Uh, this was The Back Brief. You can find me on Twitter at RodPodRod. Rod. 
and thanks for listening. And make sure you go check out ConnectingVets.com. Folks, ConnectingVets.com is all of the news that matters to you, all the best veteran news. Go check out our amazing stories. And they are, uh, we are, we are on Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram, you name it, we're there. Go check that out, ConnectingVets.com. 